Greetings to all lovers of tales, myths, and legends. Zeus, the ruler of the world, the supreme god of Olympus, a passionate lover, and a mighty warrior, that's how we are accustomed to seeing him. A stern middle-aged man with lightning bolts in his hands, but he wasn't always like that. Today, we will learn the story of this god from his birth to his ascent to the throne. We will try to unravel the intricacies of his love affairs, see how he rules the world, and understand for what he punishes or rewards people. Zeus wasn't particularly lucky with his family. His father, Cronus, the supreme god at the time, would swallow his children as soon as they were born. No, he wasn't hungry, but an oracle had predicted to him that one of his offspring would overthrow Cronus. Considering that Cronus himself had castrated his father with a sickle to gain power, such paranoia on his part is quite justified. Zeus's mother, Rhea, was not fond of what was happening, to say the least. When a new child was born, she decided that she would never give him to her deranged husband. Instead of the baby, Rhea brought Cronus a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he swallowed it without realizing. She hid the newborn in the mountains on the island of Crete, leaving him under the care of the nymphs Adrastea and Ide. There, he was safe from harm, nourished with ambrosia and nectar brought by eagles, indulged with sweet honey from the slopes of Mount Dict, and fed with milk from the goat Amalthea, which made him grow stronger. Zeus would not forget his caretakers. When he ascended to Olympus, he placed Amalthea in the sky as the constellation Capricorn, taking one of her horns and giving it to the nymphs. This became the famous Horn of Plenty. Zeus's cradle was located in a deep cave, and at its entrance stood the Curites, demons of the Earth's vegetative forces and the companions of the goddess Rhea. They guarded the infant's rest, and when he began to cry, they would dance and strike their spears against their shields, creating an unimaginable noise that drowned out the baby's cries, preventing Cronus from hearing them. For little Zeus, this dance was like a lullaby. He would calm down and stop crying. Once, four of the Curites, Leus, Salus, Cerberus, and Aegean dared to enter Zeus's cave to collect the sacred honey from the bees. They saw Zeus's swaddling clothes, and their armor shattered on their bodies. Zeus transformed them into birds, a singing thrush, a green woodpecker, Cerberus, and a hoopoe. According to beliefs, their appearance was a good omen. Thus, little Zeus grew up in peace and safety. His mother Rhea occasionally visited him, and from her, he learned who he truly was and who his father was. Cronus's cruelty ignited a fire in Zeus's soul, and that fire was the thirst for revenge. Finally, Zeus grew up and became a young god. It was then that he met and fell in love with Metis, the goddess of wisdom, cunning, and prudence. Of course, Zeus couldn't hide anything from his beloved, so he told her who he was and how he wanted to avenge cruel Cronus and free his sisters and brothers. The cunning goddess suggested a way to accomplish this, they needed to brew a special potion and give it to Cronus without him noticing. Metis's plan seemed reasonable to Zeus, and he sought help from his mother, Rhea. Rhea devised how it could be done. She sent Zeus to Cronus as a cupbearer, and he added the potion to the wine. As soon as Cronus drank it, he immediately regurgitated the stone he had swallowed instead of Zeus, and then all of Rhea's children. Cronus was confused and furious because now the prophecy could come true, but he wouldn't give up so easily. Cronus called upon his brothers and sisters, the Titans, for help. And thus, the war began, lasting for many years, known as the Titanomachy. They say the battlefield was located in Thessaly, between Mount Otis and Olympus. Neither side wanted to give in to the other until one day, tired of watching her children and grandchildren fight, Gia suggested to Zeus that he should free the Cyclopes from Tartarus, where Cronus had imprisoned them. The Cyclopes were set free, and the balance of power shifted, as they were incredibly strong and skilled craftsmen. The famous thunderbolts and lightning of Zeus were their creation, as were the helmets of Hades and the trident of Poseidon. In addition to the Cyclopes, Zeus also brought forth the hundred-handed giants, the Centimanes, from the darkness of Tartarus. 
They also aided in the battles, hurling entire mountains at the Titans. Faced with such a relentless onslaught, the siblings of Cronus couldn't withstand it. They were broken, bound, and cast into Tartarus, the very place from which Zeus had brought his mighty allies. It seemed like the war was over, the enemies defeated, and the time had come for peace to reign. However, not everyone was satisfied with this outcome. Gia, who had helped Zeus achieve victory, did not expect him to be so cruel to her children, the Titans. Naturally, she harbored resentment and desired revenge against the Olympians. To achieve this, Gia rallied her giants, her own offspring, against Zeus. Led by Eurymedon, they began hurling rocks and burning oaks into the sky, aiming to destroy the gods. Of course, the Olympians couldn't let this go unanswered, and thus the war known as the Gigantomachy began. It seemed that the gods should easily overcome the giants, but none of them could be slain by the hand of an immortal. Then Hera and the Moirai, the fates, predicted that only a mortal could bring victory. Gia was not idle either, she sought a magical herb that would make her children invulnerable. Upon learning of this, Zeus prohibited Eos, Helios, Selene, and the evening star from shining. He then sent his mortal son, Heracles, Hercules, to search for the magical herb. Under the dim light of the stars, Heracles found it and brought it to Olympus. Thus, the gods gained an advantage over the Titans. Heracles also slew the mightiest of the giants, Alcyonius, with an arrow soaked in the venomous blood of the Hydra. Alcyonius' secret was that he couldn't be killed on the land where he was born, so Heracles lured him to Boeotia. Another powerful giant, Porphyrian, was inflamed with passion for Hera through the mischief of Eros and attacked her, tearing her clothes. Zeus then struck him with a lightning bolt, and Heracles finished him off with his bow. One by one, the giants met their demise at the hands of the gods. Thus, the snake-footed giant, Ephialtes, was killed by the blow of Dionysus's Thyrsus, Hephaestus killed Mimas, Athena slew Enceladus and Echion, and so they all perished. To commemorate the victory over the giants, Zeus placed a stone, the Omphalos, in Delphi, the navel of the earth, the very stone that Cronus had swallowed in place of Zeus. The struggle came to an end, and the rule of the Olympians was firmly established. However, Gia was not appeased. Together with Tartarus, Gia gave birth to Typhon, a mighty giant with a human torso down to the waist and snakes for legs. He possessed incredible strength and immense stature, unmatched by anyone. On his back were a hundred dragon heads with fiery eyes and black tongues, and from his jaws came the bellowing of a bull, the roar of a lion, and the howl of a dog. Here is the true ruler over the gods, Gia thought, as she sent him toward Olympus. Upon seeing Typhon, the gods were terrified, and none dared to face him. All except Zeus abandoned Olympus, while he prepared for battle. The earth shook so violently that even the inhabitants of the underworld trembled, and the earth, sea, and even the sky burst into flames. Typhon raged, swinging his enormous arms and roaring ferociously, but Zeus was swift and nimble, and the giant couldn't even touch him with a finger. Finally, a precise lightning strike struck the monster. Typhon was defeated and cast down into Tartarus, and his flames erupted from the clefts of Mount Etna. But this imprisonment did not pacify him. When the chains that held him weakened, Typhon attempted to stir, causing earthquakes. Having triumphed over Typhon, Zeus became the true ruler of the world. He established a new order, with his attributes being the Aegis, a cloak made from the skin of the goat that nursed Zeus along with an eagle or a chariot drawn by eagles, a scepter as a symbol of power, and, of course, Zeus's famous lightning bolts. However, wherever there is power and authority, there will always be those who seek to obtain them. Zeus faced attempts to overthrow him. Poseidon, Athena, Apollo, and Hera conspired against him. The plot involved Zeus being slightly lulled to sleep, and the rebels planned to bind him with chains and cast him into Tartarus. Zeus was saved by his beloved Thetis, who called upon the hundred-handed giant Briareus for help, and the plot failed. 
After the rebellion, Poseidon, Apollo, and the king of Aegina, Aeacus, built the walls of Troy, while Hera was suspended on golden chains between the sky and the earth. Zeus intended to marry Thetis, but he was dissuaded by Prometheus, who had a vision that Thetis's son would be stronger than his father, and Zeus did not want to risk his power. Zeus acts as a protector of laws, safeguarding the sanctity of oaths made by humans. He upholds the unbreakable law of hospitality, caring for strangers who seek assistance and shelter. Envoys and messengers are under his protection as well. His name protects even the most wretched beggar from scorn, all he has to do is touch the edge of the hearth and from that moment not a single hair will fall from his head. Once, disguised as a human, Zeus ventured to the earth with Hermes to see if people were observing his sacred laws. After sunset, they arrived in a certain city, knocking on every door, seeking lodging. However, all doors closed before the two travelers. It was already night when they knocked on the door of a small hut on a hill outside the city. There lived a poor elderly couple, Philemon and Bossus. The kind-hearted couple offered stools to the strangers and kindled a fire by tossing in dry leaves and bark. Philemon gathered a few vegetables from the garden, and Bossus cooked them in a clay pot. They set the table and prepared a comfortable bed for their guests. But as they noticed that the amount of food and drink did not diminish but replenished, and their modest cups and plates turned into pure gold, they recognized the gods before them and fell to their knees before their majestic guests. Philemon wanted to sacrifice their only goose to the gods, but Zeus restrained him. The four of them climbed to the top of the hill, and in the morning light, the elderly couple saw a magnificent temple standing in place of their humble shack, reflected in the waters of a large lake. The gods submerged the inhospitable city, turning its inhabitants into frogs. Philemon and Bossus lived for many more years, serving as priests in the new temple, until one day they transformed into two intertwining trees, their trunks fused together. Thus, their final wish was fulfilled to die together and not witness each other's death. Zeus's amorous nature is a separate topic for discussion. Let us delve into the love triangles of the Thunderer. There are plenty of individuals to talk about since Zeus had three wives and countless lovers, including nymphs, goddesses, and mortal women. Let's start with Zeus's wives. The first one was Metis, the daughter of Oceanus and Tethys, the goddess of wisdom and cunning. It was she who advised Zeus on how to free his brothers and sisters from the belly of Cronus. The Thunderer loved Metis dearly, and they lived in bliss until Gaia predicted that his wife would bear him children. The firstborn would be a girl who would grow up to be a great warrior, and the second would be a boy who would overthrow Zeus, just as Zeus himself had overthrown Cronus. In general, it's a family tradition for someone's son to overthrow them. Zeus grew concerned. He didn't want to repeat the mistakes of the previous generations, so he came up with another idea. Why cut off the branches of a tree when you can uproot it entirely? So, when Metis announced that she was pregnant, Zeus proposed a kind of game to her, testing who was better at the art of transformation. Metis, unaware of the deceit her beloved had in store for her, laughed playfully and began changing her shape. She transformed into a snake, a wild boar, a lioness, and even a fly. Zeus seemed pleased. He praised her and added to his own praise, saying, But can you become something without form? Metis understood what he meant and transformed into water, a tiny droplet that fell into the palm of the thunderer. Without hesitation, he swallowed her. Essentially, he did the same thing his father had done, but he solved the problem earlier. He deceived the goddess of cunning. However, one day he would pay for it with a terrible headache, quite literally. And from his head, Athena, the daughter of Metis, would emerge. I have already talked about Athena in a video, which you can find in the playlist on the channel. Zeus's second wife was Themis, the daughter of Uranus and Gaia, the goddess of justice. However, in the beginning, Zeus's mother, Rhea, was against this marriage and forbade him from marrying again. 
Zeus was infuriated by her prohibition. How could she forbid something to the ruler of the world? He told Rhea to be silent, or he would simply rape her. Rhea was not afraid, on the contrary, she transformed into a snake and attacked her son. Zeus did not lose his composure and also transformed into a snake, coiling around his mother and overpowering her. Now nothing stood in the way of his marriage to Themis. From this union, three daughters of Themis were born, the goddesses of the seasons, who maintain order in nature and guard the gates of Olympus, opening and closing the gates of the clouds. They were named Eunomia, the goddess of order, Dyke, the goddess of justice, and Irene, the goddess of peace. Themis also gave birth to the Moirai, the goddesses of fate who weave the thread of destinies. Even the gods themselves are powerless before them. They are called Clotho, the spinner, Lachesis, the measurer of the length of the thread, and Atropus, the inflexible one who cuts the thread. As you already know, these are not ordinary threads but the threads of life for both gods and humans. The marriage of Zeus and Themis was short-lived, and they separated. However, the Thunderer kept the goddess of justice by his side as an advisor. Zeus's third wife was his sister Hera, known to all for her jealousy and quick temper. Their secret relationship began long before their marriage, with Hera playing an active role and using a typical female ruse. She repeatedly rejected Zeus's advances, only fueling his desire. One day, Zeus transformed into a cuckoo chick that fell out of the nest right in front of Hera. Seeing this, she picked up the chick and held it close to warm it. At that moment, Zeus revealed his true form and attempted to seduce his sister. Unperturbed, Hera said she would surrender to him if he promised to marry her. At that moment, Zeus was not thinking with his head and agreed to the condition, immediately taking her as his wife. The beautiful Hera became Zeus's last wife, but neither her beauty nor her jealousy could restrain the amorous god. One of his first lovers was Euronymy, the daughter of Oceanus and Tethys. She bore Zeus three daughters, embodiments of grace and attractiveness, known as the Charites or Graces. They were named Aglia, the personification of splendor, Euphrosyne, the personification of joy, and Talia, the personification of abundance. In Roman mythology, they were called the Graces. Zeus seduced his sister Demeter in the form of a snake, and their union resulted in the birth of Persephone. Disguised as a shepherd, Zeus seduced the Tetanus Nemosyne, who bore him nine daughters known as the Muses. Each muse patronized a specific art form, with some presiding over music and others over philosophy. The Muses resided on Mount Helicon, where the fountain of inspiration flowed. The Tetanus Leto bore Zeus Apollo and Artemis. Zeus seduced her in the form of a quail. I have covered the consequences of this union in a video about Apollo. I have also discussed another lover of Zeus, this time a mortal, in a video about Dionysus. She was Semela, the daughter of King Cadmus of Thebes. Zeus often lost his head over the beauty of mortal women. To seduce Europa, he transformed into a white bull. When she saw him, she was amazed by his beauty and wanted to caress him. The bull was docile and affectionate, behaving like a puppy, and lay at her feet. Overwhelmed by curiosity, Europa decided to ride the bull, disregarding the fearful cries of her attendants. As soon as she mounted him, the bull rushed off and galloped across the sea. The bull carried Europa to the island of Crete, where Zeus revealed his true form and possessed her. Io, a priestess of Hera and a beautiful maiden, had a strange dream that the supreme god of Olympus, Zeus, desired her. The dream became a reality, but Hera discovered their affair. To protect Io from her wrath, Zeus transformed her into a white cow. When Hera saw the cow, she demanded it as a gift. Zeus could not refuse his wife, so Hera took Io, assigning the hundred-eyed giant Argus as her guardian. To free his beloved Io, Zeus ordered Hermes to put Argus to sleep and kill him. Thus, Io regained her freedom, but she remained in the form of a silent cow. Enraged by her escape, 
Hera created a gigantic gadfly that tormented Io relentlessly, stinging her wherever she went. Io fled from country to country but found no respite. In her wanderings, she came across a cliff where Prometheus, the chained man, resided. He informed her that only in Egypt would she find relief from her sufferings. When Io arrived there, Zeus restored her true form, and she gave birth to a son named Epiphus, who became the first king of Egypt. Callisto, another lover of Zeus, was a companion of Artemis and pledged to remain a virgin at all costs. However, Zeus was cunning. He assumed the form of Artemis and, in that guise, seduced Callisto. It happened just as he expected. Several months later, Callisto discovered she was pregnant and realized she had been deceived. She suspected that Zeus had come to her in the guise of Artemis. Callisto tried to hide her pregnancy, but one day, while bathing, Artemis noticed her swollen belly. Regardless of how it happened, the vow was broken, and Callisto needed to be punished. Seeing Artemis' anger, Zeus transformed Callisto into a bear and hid her in the mountains. However, concealing his beloved in the form of a beast was not the best idea since Artemis was the goddess of hunting. She easily tracked down Callisto and shot an arrow into her heart. To save her child, Zeus sent Hermes to the dying Callisto, and he raised her to the heavens as the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear. Zeus took on various forms to seduce women. He seduced Yuri Medusa as an ant, Antiope as a satyr, Thytis as a pigeon, and Da as a stallion. Once, he even transformed into a golden shower to seduce Danae, the daughter of King Acrisius. The oracle had predicted to the king that he would be killed by his own grandson, so Acrisius kept Danae locked in an underground chamber with a maid. Zeus, desiring the beauty of Danae, transformed into a golden shower and impregnated her. From their union, their son Perseus was born. Acrisius imprisoned Danae and her son in a chest and cast them into the sea. The waves carried the chest to the island of Seriphos, where the king, Polydectes, soon developed a passion for Danae. With the help of her son Perseus, she escaped his advances and returned to Argos. Zeus visited Princess Leda of Aetolia in the form of a swan. This happened on the river Euorotus, where he seduced her. Subsequently, she laid three eggs, from which hatched Castor, Polydeuces, Pollux, and Helen. Zeus seduced many, but there were also those who rejected him, such as Sinope. When the thunderbolt wielder abducted her, he allowed her to ask for anything she desired. She asked to remain a virgin. Not only women pleased Zeus, once, he fell in love with the beautiful youth Ganymede, the son of King Tross of Troy. Zeus abducted him, transforming into an eagle while Ganymede was hunting on the slopes of Mount Ida. He seized him and carried him to Olympus, where he became the cupbearer, replacing Hebe and Zeus's lover. Ganymede was granted immortality and eternal youth. That's the end of this rather long video. When you judge the ruler of Olympus, remember that judging gods, even those forgotten, can have consequences. And our modern morality, in my opinion, is not applicable to the actions of that time. But that's just my opinion, feel free to share yours in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, check out other videos in the playlist on the channel. Like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for your attention and see you in the new videos.